Welcome back. You're watching Showdown. I'm joined by Labor's Ed Husick. Thanks for your company. G'day. Paul Fletcher from the Liberal Party. I'm sure you're glad to be here. Good evening. And Dr. Greg O'Mahony. Thanks for your company again, as always. Good to be here, Pat. Greg, uh, were you in raptures with Alan Jones's uh, unreserved apology? No, I didn't think it was unreserved. Um, and, you know, you just had a pretty heated debate on it. But uh, I thought it was the apology of someone who either didn't feel sorry or couldn't say it. Um, uh, I'm talking about the article yesterday, which was his best chance, I think, to um, say sorry. And um, it was 40 or 50 paragraphs, including four very small paragraphs of a very qualified expression of regret, followed by an attempt to paint himself as the victim, followed by some bizarre explanations. There was alcohol served at the function. I'd only heard the phrase that morning, one or two other things. And then he launched into a pretty savage attack on the Prime Minister and the policies. Um, so no, I'd, I'd, I'd agree that it, it certainly wasn't what, what you could describe as an unreserved apology. Paul Fletcher, there's some Conservatives, and I don't exactly put you on that wing of the Liberal Party, but there are some Conservatives that think that this is over the top to be spending so much time talking about Alan Jones. Bit of an irony, really, yeah. given just how many hours of the week he devotes to being over the top about whatever issue he chooses to hours on end on his show, isn't it? Well, Peter, what's happened here is that Alan Jones has said something, as Tony Abbott has described, that was wrong, unacceptable and offensive. And then, in response to that, what the Labor Party has sought to do is spend the last two days trying to divert the media cycle and I, and I to a to continuing debate on this issue. And I but do want to get I, to that in a moment. Can I just make one thing but, absolutely sure. clear? I just want to remind you and your viewers what it is that Tony Abbott said in the Parliament. He said... He was very gracious said, in the Parliament, absolutely. The place good parents have in the hearts of their children and the Coalition continues to extend its deepest sympathies to the Prime Minister. So that is Tony Abbott's position, that is the Liberal Party's position. I might say he also went on to say, it is a remarkable parent who produces a Prime Minister yeah. of this country. Absolutely. And can I just note that Tony Abbott's parents are my constituents and they are remarkable parents and they will be producing a Prime Minister of this country. You should hear what they say about you as a local member. They're huge fans. <laughs> but that makes it all the more repugnant than what Jones said, correct? Look, clearly what Alan Jones said, as Tony Abbott has said, as Malcolm Turnbull has said, as a whole range of coalition spokesmen have said, and I'm happy to add my voice to that, what Alan Jones said was wrong, unacceptable and offensive. But can I say, Peter, I think you are really falling into the Labor Party's media manipulation now. Mm. They've spent a couple of days <laughs> really seeking to move this debate uh, on trying to link this with Tony Abbott and... Um, you know, what most people are concerned about is the management of this country, uh, the fact that we've had uh, interest rates drop now by the Reserve Bank in recognition of the fact that growth is not going we, ahead. We're going to get to all of that. I, I, we are going to get to interest rates and, and superannuation issues a bit later in the program. But just let me ask this, because Michael Kroger seemed to be so enraptured uh, with this non-apology apology that Alan Jones delivered. Uh, did you think it was an unequivocal apology? Well, look, Alan Jones has delivered an apology. Did you think it was and that's, an unequivocal and that's apology? That's for him. Look, I didn't spend my time watching the apology, but if somebody says they're apologising, then I think it's incumbent on all of us to accept that. You know, the important thing here is about civility in public debate and trying to maintain a standard of civility. If you make an apology, what you're essentially indicating is that you recognise that you've uh, transgressed the standards of civility and that's been done. What is important is that we do seek to maintain to the maximum extent possible civility in the public debate in the way we treat each other and that we focus on the issues and frankly as politicians that is what we should be focused yep. on because we are here uh, either in the case of Ed and his party as the government of the country or in the case of the coalition as the alternative government of the country. And I think what the Australian people want us to be focused on is the issues of the day, their future, their prospects and not uh, engaged in what is essentially um, an internal uh, media debate about the particular conduct of one media figure. Ed Hughes? Uh, look, uh, a number of areas. I, I couldn't agree more with Paul on this issue about civility. Um, I think there's something, and I want to come back to this point, because I think it, there's a broader issue at play here that this falls within that context. But uh, there, there's a, a very deep reaction uh, along the lines of what was expressed earlier by yourself and others. That is, if you put yourself in the place of someone who's lost a parent, I mean, that's one of the... Uh, I haven't lost a parent, and I don't want to imagine what it's going to be like in that that day when it happens, but I wouldn't want that to be part and parcel of political debate 
in, in that way. I just think there's, this, this is coming back to the point about civility. I think there is something in our political debate where we feel that uh, more and more we can um, push the uh, boundaries, we can push the edge of the debate uh, to extremes that, you know, in the States they've had to confront. I was there at the time when Gabby Giffords uh, was shot in that awful, uh, that mm. awful incident. One of the things that came out afterwards was the notion that the Tea Party was putting these crosshairs on all these Democrat uh, Congress people and targeting them and using quite emotive language in that way. And I think that the concern is, and uh, the reason why it's come back in terms of um, you know, the discussion on, on Tony Abbott, is because it's been part of this very hot political environment for the last 12 months. The type of rallies you've seen, the type of talk that's been on. Yeah, but you guys are both cooked trying to link this to Abbott. I mean, uh, it's a bit silly, isn't it, calling for him to apologise for what Jones did. I mean, that, that's the equivalent of me demanding that Paul here apologise for what Jones did, or even that Michael Kroger apologise for what Jones did. I mean, no one expects that. My, my gripe here is with Alan Jones, and with the fact that his apology, in, in my view, is worthless. He apologised for the chaff bag comment and then sure enough once enough time had passed then signed a jacket sewn together with chaff bags and then purchased it himself at the auction that's how much his apology means generally he says it but it's garbage or it certainly was in that case well i just think uh you know any apology delivered through gritted teeth never seems to have the impact that it should i take on board uh, what Paul was saying about, you know, you'd made the, the point that, you know, he's apologised and that should be taken into account. And I'm sure there's, there's an element of that. But from my perspective, it, it almost seemed like the apology was uh, more afterthought. I mean, why... In public life, well, a lot of us have been... In, if he hadn't been recorded, well, a lot of he us wouldn't have, have been, done it. A lot of us in some shape or form uh, know that the, the type of comments that we have do get picked up. It's open. I, I don't believe that there's any of this, you know, the Chatham House rules that... Uh, exist if you say something, well ask Mitt Romney, you know, what he mm. thinks about uh, you know, private comments. I think you've got to be conscious at any point of what your comments are like and they have to be a reflector of what you think and I just think, you know, being in that, that situation, you know, you mentioned the, the chaff bag and the, the jacket and the, the prize and, and the like, I just think, wouldn't you know that at that point those type of comments have drawn such a bad reaction because people but don't he, he'd apologise for the chaff. He'd apologise for the chaff bag, think, and then he did yeah, that. I think there's another point here, Peter. Politicians have a responsibility in our collective behaviour to contribute towards the tone of the debate yep. and to hopefully, through the way we behave, demonstrate some leadership. Now, um, unfortunately and I don't want to be partisan about this, but I, I really am not sure we're living up to that standard if we see an episode like this being effectively sought to be manipulated for political purposes. So and I, and I, I think, think there's been some of that by the Labor Party, I really do. I think mm -hmm. it, it, there really is a responsibility on all of us. And can, can, can I ask can, though, Paul, in that context, are you comfortable with the level of debate, public debate in Australia at the moment? Do you think it is overly personal? Do you think there is a context at play that's that's something to be ashamed of? Um, I think that we can always seek to improve our standards. But can I just say, I was really proud to be sitting in the parliament when Tony said the things he did say about the Prime Minister's loss. Because I thought he expressed so beautifully what all of us feel about the basic emotion there when he said, we all know the place good parents have in the hearts of their children. I thought he really beautifully expressed a sentiment which any parent and any child can understand. Which only highlights how much more disgraceful Jones is compared to the person that he sees himself as a mentor to, which is the leader of the opposition. Well, I just think the important thing is the tone that Tony Abbott set in his comments there. And that really, I think, does remind us of what is at stake here. Um, the importance of conducting yourself as a political leader with dignity. I think Tony does a very good job of that and he sets a good standard for all of us. We're going to come back from the commercial break and, and talk about wider political issues, but just before then, one, one thing that I think is fascinating about this, and I've seen this over the last few days because I've been very vocal on Twitter, I wrote a column straight away about it, I, I made an editorial on the Sunday show Australian Agenda about my thoughts on Alan Jones. And what has been so instructive, and we saw it again tonight with Michael Kroger trying to argue that I was jealous of, of Alan Jones. I mean. As much as I'd love to be getting up at 4.30am every morning to do morning radio, I'm not quite sure that that's quite my shtick. Um, the reality is, is that those 
uh, that is what happens and has happened for so many decades in this country. When you try to take on Alan Jones, you get shouted down, you get attacked, it gets personally vicious against you, not just by Jones, but quite frankly by his supporters. And there is this effort to, in a sense, demonise you because you are prepared to take the guy on. Well, I'm really at a point with this guy after what he did in the last couple of days where enough is enough. He is a law unto himself. If that's an unreserved apology, then that is an absolute joke. Well, it's interesting. I mean, um, Michael Kroger talked at length about his charity work, and I heard Graham Richardson say the same thing last night. And I think, I'd be interested to know Paul's thoughts on this, but I mean, I think that the highest calling of public life is to turn your, your opportunities and your talents to the benefit of the disadvantaged. And yeah. the little snippets I've heard of the Alan Jones show, he does the opposite to that. I mean, if you listen to the subject of his rants, they're Indigenous peoples, they're people addicted to heroin, they're asylum seekers. They're the most marginalised people in the community. And not only is he attacking them, he seems to be trying to mobilise a swathe of the well, and then community. His mainstream listener for a long period there was getting, um, having the wool pulled over their eyes about cash for comment when he was spruiking well, things like banks uh, at the same time as not actually acknowledging uh, that he was getting paid to do so. Well, I care less about that, frankly, but I think his stick and, and the targets that he identifies, I just think it's. It's a pretty dark art. And uh, Paul, do you listen to his show? Would you agree with that? Well, uh, look, I certainly do listen to Alan from time to time. Um, Peter, I want to be clear. You've chosen to uh, mount a particular argument this evening. That's a matter for you. Um, in, in fairness to both you and Ed Husick, I should say that you guys were locked in to come on this show before Alan Jones's remarks ever went public. So uh, you're not party to the topic matter but, but, as, as person. Yeah, I'm still I, looking for my rabbit's foot. <laughs> uh, I, I do just want to say, um, Two things. Firstly, again, he has uh, what he said was wrong, as coalition spokesmen from Tony Abbott down have said, but he has apologised. Uh, Let's just hope this time, unlike the last time he apologised about the chaff bag, that he doesn't partake in some sort of sewn together jacket with the word shame on it, for the example. The second thing. Because history tells us that's what he'll do. Just the second thing I'd like to say. One uh, recent observation of mine is of Alan coming to a charity function in my electorate, nine o'clock at night when he had to get up early the next day, the people who organised that function were very grateful that he was there. Um, and that's simply an observation I can make. That's the paradox of him, though. I mean, that's what you're really saying here, uh, without being prepared to quite put it that way, is that that's the paradox of the man, is that he does all these well, things... Again, Peter, you're putting yeah. words in my mouth. You, you, well, I, know that, I, I know that you're a politician, I, so like most, you've got to be careful because if Alan Jones puts you in his sights, that's concerning. No, but no, no, that's, no, no, no. I, I think there's something... Think I that's think not what Paul... Oh, let's let's think, get serious here. That's, that's the reality no, about the way... No, I think people are scared of him. No, I've heard so many Peter, stories no, Peter, about respect. Alan Jones using conduits to pass on indirect, not threats necessarily, but not far off. There is a more important point here. It is really not appropriate for politicians to be sitting in judgment on any media figure. It's really not appropriate for us to be saying, uh, expressing a particular view about uh, the no, merits of any that. particular media figure. I don't agree with you on that, Paul, for the simple reason that in, in public life, uh, you know, the, the type of words uh, uh, that we choose, the type of thoughts that we express and the platform that we have, we need to be very mindful of that. And if someone has crossed the line, then regardless of if they're an MP or if they're, uh, you know, they're a senior, you know, figure within the media, I think we are accountable for our actions and words. So I, I, I do, I mean, I, I do agree, I, I certainly got the point of where you were coming from, that's why I was uh, talking up in the way I was, but I, I certainly have a different view on that. I think, you know, when you make those type of statements, you've got to, you know, you basically got to stand up and account for it. You've got to be held to account for it. And, you know, part of the problem was that uh, Alan Jones wasn't prepared to say, you know, frankly uh, and quickly and just, you know, make the statement. What I did, what I said was wrong. You don't have to couch it in all these qualifications. If you're wrong, you're wrong. I, I don't want to ever be in the... Look, and, and I'm happy for people to come back and judge me on this. I never want to be in the position that you have to get to that level in political debate where you target people in a way that, that requires vitriol to you know, get you to the landing point. What, what I'm saying is it gets very, very dangerous if you have politicians in a position of saying, oh, well, this particular person in the media is acceptable, this particular person is not. That's starting to get you, I think, into very, very dangerous territory. But, Paul, I don't... But with respect, I don't... Where, where are people saying that this person's acceptable and this is not. I think what we're focused on here is uh, you know, a situation where someone's made reference to someone experiencing grief 
Um, and oh, yeah, then Labor is definitely trying to politicise this. Oh, You're not pretending oh, otherwise, oh, are you? No, no, no. Well, can, can, can I, I, let's come to this point. Oh, Actually, let's, let's, let's deal with this point. Yeah, I think can, this can, can I just put it in a context for you? I think that there are elements of Labor certainly politicising it. However, uh, the flip side to that, I suppose, is I'm sure... Uh, that there is, you know, the Labor Party is very tribal. I'm sure that there are a lot of Labor people that are pretty damn outraged on behalf of the Prime Minister in relation to what Alan yeah, Jones has absolutely. done. And that's initially, at least, I think, driven a lot of anger, but I think it's now bubbled over to it being a politicising thing a little bit. But there's a more significant pattern here, which is that uh, what Labor frontbencher after Labor frontbencher has said today and over the last couple of days is uh, trying to uh, blame something that was said on Tony Abbott demanding an apology from Tony Abbott and it's a continuation of this pattern we've had from this government. This is the same political tactic that the Labor Party used in Queensland where they sought to demonise Campbell Newman in a very unpalatable way. This is the Labor political machine at work and they've jumped on an issue and sought to turn it to their political advantage. And again, I make the point, Peter, the more time you spend talking about it, the more you are essentially um, being responsible right. to it. Good segue, because we're going to take a commercial break and we are going to move on from Alan Jones, uh, even though his spiteful hissing will no doubt continue for a long time to come on morning radio. Uh, one final comment on it is if you haven't read David Pemberthy's article, you can get it on The Punch, you can get it on news.com, I believe it was in The Telegraph today, it was certainly in The Herald Sun in Melbourne where I was this morning, uh, where they, by the way, editorialised that Alan Jones should get off the airwaves and I couldn't agree more. But David Pemberthy's article is well worth a read as the final word uh, on the disgrace that is Alan Jones. When we come back, we're going to take a look at interest rates and superannuation. Back in a moment. What do we have here? Two entrenched views. Real estate website. Oh, he wants a new home. And she has some plans to renovate. Either way, I'm thinking they don't have a lot of spare time to get their loan, right? Whether you're refinancing, renovating or buying, ANZ Home Loan Specialists can help make it real. My money's on the renovation. This is Roundup Pump and Go. Just pump and go. For easy, continuous spraying. Kill weeds, roots and all. Fast. With Roundup 5 litre Pump and Go. that created the legendary Suzuki Hayabusa comes a machine with the same sporty DNA. The exhilarating Kazashi luxury sports sedan. Start your senses. Natasha contacted me first. I suggested that we meet straight away. That date was so... Good. There's something that you can't really describe well when you meet the right person. Review all your matches for free at eHarmony.com.au I love this one. There's an amazing choice behind Kmart's irresistibly low prices. Five dollars. <laughs> At American Express, we go above and beyond to make the impossible possible 24-7. We've personally delivered replacement cards, found doctors who speak your language, tracked down lost wedding dresses, turned three-star into a million-star dining. We've even returned a loved one home. Impossible. It's two letters too long. American Express. Realise the potential. Pools come in heaps of shapes and sizes at great prices. Choose the right one. It's not hard. for many different reasons, we fly for one. You're the reason we fly.
Welcome back. You're watching Showdown now. This is a three minutes and 50 second Alan Jones free period. Um, superannuation. Ed Husick, you guys are the champions of superannuation, yet now you're planning to basically gut everyone's super in the name of a short-term return to surplus. No, it's good that you're relying on fact. Uh, well, that's true. Well, no, I mean... There, there will be a number of decisions that we need to make in the context of trying to ensure that the yeah, budget remains in surplus. Yeah, people's long-term savings to get to a short-term no. surplus that you need politically. And, and uh, you know, we'll have all sorts of scare campaigns as we had uh, over the course of the 12 months and they'll turn out to basically evaporate into nothing. So, you know... As will everyone super as you guys tax it to the hill and back. Yeah, well, that's your view, but they don't necessarily... Uh, do you think it's a concern, though? I mean, think that that's seriously, a... ageing's an issue. Labor, as Bill Kelty's pointed out, have got the runs on the board in terms terms of super and all of that is being put at risk planning for the aging population as well as uh, people planning for their own personal retirement uh, from an idea that Labor originated through Paul Keating to start with uh, it's now been eroded by a short-term honey fix to try to get to a surplus that you need politically no I don't no, I don't agree I mean we, we committed in on a number of fronts in terms of uh uh, superannual the aging population, superannuation, ensuring um, uh, people have the opportunity to stay in the workforce as long as they want to. The type of things that we've done uh, along the way mean that uh, uh, we will keep doing that. So I just I don't agree at all with the way that you're characterising it. Paul Fletcher. Well, this is yet another change to superannuation. This government has made changes year after year to superannuation. Bill Kelty has warned against these kinds of changes and raiding the honey point. Let's be clear what superannuation is supposed to do. It's supposed to be a long-term savings vehicle so that more and more people are able to provide for their own retirement so it doesn't have to be funded on the pension and funded by all other taxpayers. That's what it's supposed to do. But every time it changes, it reduces the incentive to save. We've already seen the contribution limits reduced from 50000 to 25000 now you have people uh, effectively facing the threat of having the tax rate increase. In fact, Paul Howes of the Australian Workers' Union said yesterday, we've got no problem with progressive taxation. That's code for increasing tax rates on superannuation. And if Paul Howes, the head of the Australian Workers' Union, is saying it's going to happen, well, I think we'd all better work out, w w be worried, because this <laughs> government is about to jack up tax rates on superannuation and really damage saving. Greg Money, last thoughts on this? Well, I think it is self-defeating policy. You know, the whole point is to encourage and incentivise saving. I think the bigger structural issue with superannuation is that the billions of dollars of fees that are charged each year for performance that over the last 10 years has been worse than putting money in the bank. And I think um, some serious questions beyond tax reform needs to be looked at. Which um, we've, we've worked to reform, like we've worked to reform the source of financial advice and, and deal with those very issues as well. But you said at the outset that you think this is all about encouraging saving and helping people prepare for retirement. I don't think many people, when they put that money away and, and pay the fees that they do, expect a return that is below the bank. No, I agree. The, and I mean, we had, uh, through the GFC, I mean, you could um, you know, see what happened to returns through the course of, uh, of that event. And yeah, I absolutely agree. But we have done some things to make sure that there's, uh, people can have a, a greater sense of confidence in the security like or the what? independence of their and, advice. And, and unfortunately, what this government has not done is accepted the recommendations of the Cooper Review about governance reforms and superannuation. So we have too many union officials controlling well, superannuation. Well, right, union no, members... you get the final word on that because we are out of time, Ed Husick, but you know you'll be back and we'll be speculating about a Rudd return when you are. Ed Husick, Paul Fletcher and Dr Greg Omani, thanks for your company on this episode of Showdown. And thank you for your company, those of you that might be left through that rant about <laughs> Alan Jones. And for the record, we invited Alan Jones on the program. What an absolute shock that he didn't take us up on that. We'll keep trying, uh, rest assured of that. And for anyone that is wondering, there's lots of right-wingers on Twitter that don't like what I've said today, just so you know, I do not regret one word, never will. This is Showdown. See you later.